To tackle these and many other questions, I'm very pleased to introduce the members of our next panel, beginning with Martin Klesner. He is CEO of Has To Be. Hello to you, Martin. Welcome. Hello. And then we have... We have jingle music. Oh my God, this is going to take a long time. We have so many guests. Okay. Also, Markus Kruger, who's CEO of Panion. Markus, hello to you. Welcome. We also have Alexander Reich. Uh, he's a member of the management board at PSPA, which is the Polish Alternative Fuels Association. Hi, Alexander. And I'm also very pleased to welcome Nastya Koro. She is a senior researcher at TIER. Hi, Nastya. And last but not least, Robin van der Berg. He is product manager at TomTom. So welcome, everybody. So to get us all in the mood and just to kick off uh, some initial thoughts about this topic, we're first going to have two quick presentations, uh, first from Martin and then from Markus. So I believe, Martin, you, we flipped a coin. We didn't really, but, <laughs> but you can go first. So we're looking forward to your quick five-minute-ish presentation. Perfect. Thank you very much for being invited here. Um, I want to start this panel discussion with a very short introduction um, with some visualizations of data we had collected in our systems within the last years and to give you some very few impressions uh, what can be done with today's recognized data. So, charging infrastructure has rapidly grown in the last years. We do see a very rapid extension in our infrastructure. The map here currently does not represent the whole uh, growth of charging infrastructure. It represents the growth of infrastructure which is being connected to our IT infrastructure in uh, so the B-Energized system in that, that case. And you see that from a very fragmented way or uh, infrastructure in the first years, we get to a very detailed network uh, within the last years. In addition to that, we do see that the charging infrastructure and also especially the mobility does not end at the border. So we do see that we have a dedicated mobility corridors where also with electric mobility we have uh, a lot of cars that are traveling large distances by using the HPC uh, charging infrastructure through Europe. And on this visualization you can see that it's not limited to single countries. We also have e-mobility cross borders, which um, also says that we do need to deal with the inter and pan-European networks. If you look on the time when the user is charging, we do see that there is a very high uh, curve of the charging processes. So this curve does represent uh, the number of charging processes that are currently running during um, a period of around about uh, two weeks. And you see that there are very high um, tops and lows. And we do see that within the growth of the infrastructure, uh, energy and load management will become more and more important in order to get a more uh, flattened curve. Um, because even if you don't, this is representing the number of infrastructure of charging processes, uh, you have nearly the same picture for the consumed energy, which is stressing our electro uh, grid networks in, in Europe. Then we can have uh, very detailed information on a lot of uh, geographic information. So we do see in our infrastructure and in our collections that especially we have a very high focus to the municipalities and we have a very less infrastructure on the countryside. So uh, we do expect that within the next years we also will have or we will need to have a growth of charging infrastructure also in the regional um, uh, yeah, regions of, of Germany and also Europe in order to get a more connected network itself. It's very important or very interesting if you're looking on the charging process data um, because you can see the specific events. So we have, for example, 
uh, very different usages between ACDC and HPC use cases and the uh, amount of uh, charging processes that can be performed. So you see the Christmas holidays um, where nearly nobody is charging on, on AC because you do not have um, the charging at the workplace, which is, is missing in that set setup. You see the uh, explicit first corona lockdown. It's very interesting, but in this case, you do not see the second and third corona lockdown. Um, and we see that we have a very high growth one on the AC, and everything in the market is becoming nearly a hockey stick if you are looking on the number of charging processes that have been performed. But if you're looking on the number of kilowatt hours that have been consumed, we have a very different view on that case. So we see um, it's rapidly growing all in all in the market, but we have uh, nearly a vertical line of kilowatt hours uh, consumed on the HPC use cases. And this is a very interesting thing for, for us to see um, that a very high amount of users are using the high power charging infrastructure which is all the indication for me um, that we have a lot of users which are also traveling longer distances uh, with their electric vehicles, which I think is one of the most important things in order to become, or e-mobility to become uh, successful in the day. Uh, one last slide I want to show you is regarding the pricing. So it's also interesting that we see uh, during a very long period, starting from 2016 to now, um, that the average price per charging process for AP, uh, AC chargers is uh, decreasing with, with the amount of time. Um, DC is uh, r slowly growing, and we have a very high uh, differences in the HPC use cases, um, which we see is being reflected in the fact that there are a lot of new players coming into the market and trying to, um, at, uh, to, to focus on new pricing models. And we do see here that we are just building into um, generating individual prices. And I think if you're especially looking on this, on this chart, this is the main reason why we do not have currently um, combined or averaged tariffs for uh, mobility service providers in Germany. And we have these uh, pricing jungle on the charging infrastructure. Because if you look back to the last years, we do see that it's currently not, imp not possible to create a realistic and valid price or tariff calculations on the infrastructure use because there are so many uh, differences between the pricing and it's, it's, it's jumping and it's, it's not, uh, you cannot use it in detail for calculations. But if we do uh, forecast these, these topics, especially for DC and AC, if you're looking here, I do think that within the next six to 12 months, we will come to the fact that the MSPs are able to offer, for example, one fixed kilowatt hours for every charging process in Germany. And this will um, bring a lot of speed in the e-mobility market in order to come, come further. One thing we have here also is um, a thing which we need to consider, in once, uh, especially regarding uh, data privacy. And uh, I <coughs> looked on my card, so um, I also drive an electric vehicle, and that was uh, is a mobility profile of, of, of me. Um, so I think, especially in the use cases we need to consider, and everybody also which is operating the system needs to consider how to deal with this geographic user-related um, data, because you can see I'm traveling all the way through um, through Austria, I have a focus in Vienna and of course in, in Salzburg where we have our headquarter. But I also tried to test our infrastructure and go for holidays to uh, Dortmund and Bremen. And you see the whole um, navigation of my profile within the last year. And that's a very interesting thing um, because that's my data, but you always have the data from everybody in the world which is using e-mobility. And that will be a very interesting thing where I think we will step into discussion within the panels afterwards. So I think the main uh, topics we will deal in the future is definitely how to manage the pricing to get to a easy and verifiable uh, pricing for the vehicle user. We have to manage the energy load 
and especially we have to deal with sensitive data. So I think it will be a very interesting discussion, and enjoy. Thank you very much, Martin. <laughs> Marcus, you're up. Here we go. All right. <clears throat> so thank you very much, um, uh, first of all, for the invitation to uh, ICNC. It's my first ICNC, and I have to say, I uh, really enjoy every moment of it. Um, uh, Penion is a proud sponsor. Uh, we had a kicker tournament yesterday, so thank you for every, for, uh, to everybody who joined us last night. It was uh, great fun. Um, but probably, uh, uh, it's very probable that Penion is not too uh, well known in the market yet because we are not that old. Um, so let me please introduce you to, to Penion uh, for a couple of minutes. Um, we are 100% uh, subsidiary of ABB. We were founded last year. Um, uh, we are based out of Berlin, and we have around 25 people. And we're building software, um, software for corporate fleets that have already migrated to electromobility or are in the process of doing so. Um, and um, uh, we would like to be basically by our partner side when it comes to that. Um, so. We're striving to become an authority when it comes to bridging the gap between profitability on one end and sustainability and uh, operational excellence, business continuity on the other end. Um, and we are well aware of the fact that we are not the only ones doing that. That software has already been existing, um, but we think that we have a right to play in this market because of our heritage uh, uh, that lies within B ABB. We have access to a lot of uh, information, uh, expertise when it comes to charging and energy management on one hand that we are drawing on. On the other hand, uh, we have built up a team of uh, uh, software experts, digital company experts uh, that um, uh, have done that before. My co-founder, uh, Weston Hankins, and I have actually built a couple of companies before that, uh, also under a corporate umbrella, so we're quite confident that uh, we are well equipped for this uh, challenge. So what does that mean? Um, it means that we are working in a very customer-centric way. We are almost obsessed with customer-centric development, uh, analyzing together with co-innovation partners where the actual problems lie um, in the electrification and in management of uh, electrified fleets um, and uh, uh, find the most suitable solutions. And I think another advantage that we have is that we are allowed to be hardware manufacturer independent. So we are not relying on ABB hardware, but we are open towards uh, all kinds of manufacturers for infrastructure as well as for vehicles, obviously. So what f did we find when we were now working with our co-innovation partners when we were talking to all those fleet managers? What are the most important reasons for fleets to electrify their fleet? Um, it's mainly three things. It's one, cost, because CO2 um, emissions are costly. A ton today costs around 50 euros. Um, projections go so far to say that in 2030, that cost will go up to 85, 95 euros. And number two, it's brand recognition. A lot of companies uh, out of the um, uh, EV100 community, actually 85% state that that's one of the main drivers that their customers and their partners expect them to electrify and become sustainable. So they are going to lose business if they don't. It's an absolute imperative. Um, thirdly, it's access. As we know, already today, a lot of inner cities are blocked towards vehicles that are carbon uh, emitting. Um, and uh, major cities like Berlin, London, and um, Paris have pledged uh, to close up their inner cities for um, uh, carbon-2 emitting vehicles by 2030. So that's actually um, business-relevant uh, um, uh, reasons for companies to start at least thinking about their electrification journey and how to actually approach that topic. So, we have set out to become the companion, basically, of those fleet operators, uh, to be by their side, uh, to help them with the migration to electrified vehicles, but also to actually be there for them once they need to then manage an electrified fleet. So, 
Um, we have started to build a platform that contains a number of different software packages uh, targeting different areas. One, the EV transition journey, so that fleet managers, fleet operators can make database decisions on prioritization and on, on structure of, of uh, electronic fleets, uh, uh, electric fleets. Number two, again, the management of, of electric fleets, especially when it comes to um, uh, uh, charge planning, charge site management, uh, that is still uh, an open topic for a lot of companies. We're actually partnering here with Amazon, um, building the software together with Amazon based on Amazon information. And again, the platform uh, for C's to actually contain a couple of different features that we are in step two, three, four developing. <coughs> so what are the current barriers for electrification today? And now we are coming to the data part, more or less. It's actually um, uncertainty. Um, uncertainty when it comes to uh, questions around um, operational excellence and business continuity. Uh, it's also cost, but it's mostly uh, fear for um, jeopardizing business. Uh, so again, here I'm referring to uh, statements that were made by EV100 members. 67% are stating the lack of charging opportunities to be one of the major reasons. 64% uh, are afraid that they can't find the right vehicle that would suit their needs uh, in an electric format. Uh, yes, 58% also state that uh, capital investments are a major blocker. 54% uh, again are concerned with general implications on, on fleet operations. But you can see cost is a factor but it's mostly business continuity and um, operational excellence. And that sh clearly shows that there needs to be a lot of education uh, for EV fleet managers, for fleet operators. So 29% actually of fleet managers that have been asked state that they don't know enough about electric mobility and that they need help with uh, making the right decisions. So providing the right decisions is basically what we want to do. Um, but when you're talking about information, about data, you always have to talk about uh, things like data privacy, data protection, GDPR. Absolutely critical uh, topic. And you have to talk about the discussion that you have to have with workers' councils, with the employees who are actually blocking uh, generation of data in the many, many, many cases. So first of all, what we would like to do then, in that case, we would like to communicate through our partners to those constituents what kind of data uh, we are um, uh, generating and how we are protecting it. So absolute uh, adherence to GDPR guidelines, meaning we are only storing data uh, at a minimum level, what is absolutely necessary. Um, we're keeping it absolutely private. And we are sharing only data that is not relating to individuals, but only to cars, drives, rides, um, in order to optimize algorithms and decision-making criteria. Um, at the same time, um, we provide a lot of guideline uh, to our partners. So when we're talking about data, we are mainly uh, uh, drawing on information from um, historical data that the company has already gathered, from uh, sensory uh, information from smartphones that, by the way, can also be used by drivers, for example, to be switched on and off if needed, right? So in order to protect also certain parts of rights that are not um, public, so to speak. Um, and um, data from uh, telematics, uh, we actually work with a number of uh, telematics providers in that field. And then we have to have this discussion again um, on what kind of agreements need to be in place in order to uh, have uh, an understanding between a fleet operator and their employees, for example. What kind of policies need to be uh, put into place? Um, uh, we are providing forms, we are providing guidelines. We're actually working with a consultancy on matters uh, um, that concern workers' councils in order to have a smoother transition, because it's absolutely necessary that uh, this is a collaboration between uh, the fleet operator and their employees. So once that discussion is out of the way, 
We then obviously uh, focus on the actual analysis um, on the solutions, and I was already referring to this transition solution where we are providing data to fleet operators uh, that they can use to make better educated decisions on how to prioritize a transition, which cars to actually replace first with which other electric cars that suit their needs, how to plan infrastructure, extremely important issue, right? what kind of infrastructure to buy, um, and how all those things contribute to fulfilling um, uh, CO2 emission goals of a company. As uh, an EV transition solution, we are already working with a couple of co-innovation partners there. We have launched this product now. And uh, the other aspect, again, managing charging operations um, of an electrified fleet uh, we're talking about uh, charge site management, we're talking about workflow management, um, actually about scheduling and about um, usage analytics and notifications. So um, I would be extremely happy if uh, you have more questions uh, about the products, but uh, I would like to take this opportunity now to you know, hand it over to you again. Thank you. Thank you very much, Marcus from Panion. So everybody, I think maybe to start our conversation, why don't we just get a reminder of what kind of data we're actually talking about. And um, Martin showed us a few different types of data that was collected and evaluated, but when we're looking at the EV ecosystem, first of all, just what data are we talking about? Can somebody just give us a quick overview of the different types of data that are relevant in this ecosystem? <laughs> sure. So when you talk about data in the case of tier mobility, uh, we gather basically in two different directions. We're now live in like 15 countries, and our most uh, important source of data come from usage data on one hand and user insights. Um, for usage data, this is the historical data that you were talking about before. Uh, we know so far, for example, that we have um, 6 million riders who already conducted 65 million rides, but uh, you always need to put the quantitative data, the usage data, into the context, right, to understand why things are happening or how often they are happening. For that, we have quite a big user research team, which I'm part of, and we do, for example, surveys with our own users, recently looked into mobility habits, how people use e-scooters, e-mopeds, e-bikes. And we also talked to non-users because uh, their opinion is as much important as uh, yeah, of users. If in case of micromobility, you stumble upon it literally on the street, even if you don't take a bike or a scooter. And since Tier is a company that is striving to be the most sustainable company, we also use data to uh, ensure that the maintenance of our vehicles is uh, also on the best possible level. So we use data from our warehouses to track uh, the lifetime vehicle and to track the green operations. Okay, so user data, um, vehicle maintenance data. So those are already yeah. just two categories. And what else? I mean, are we, there's also other kinds of data being collected, isn't there? Yeah, I think, well, one important part, of course, is the charging station data itself that needs to be um, collected, processed, homogenized across these different regions uh, of the world. Uh, and we were talking, we're focusing a lot on Europe, but of course, there's also uh, the Americas and, and Asia that also need to be electrified. Uh, and there's still quite some barriers to uh, make sure that all that charging station data is actually accessible in a clear and understandable way for um, drivers and not just the uh, ones that are techy and that know already a little bit about uh, what it means to drive an electric vehicle, but also to drive uh, the people that are currently driving an, uh, a combustion engine vehicle and to make them aware that there's ubiquitous charging available and accessible around them. So I think as Tom Tom as a mapping company, we have a responsibility to expose that and make that accessible uh, in, a, in an easy way. So if we say, as we frequently do, that the EV charging industry is reliant on an ecosystem-based approach, is there enough data being shared throughout the EV ecosystem in your assessment? I think in, okay, sorry, go ahead. 
I just wanted to add, because we're uh, mostly uh, focused on data collection. I represent PSPA, uh, the Polish Alternative Fuels Association, and we, I think both these points are very important from, from our perspective, because data is, first of all, a, a tool for market development, to kind of know what market you're going in. As an organization that represents over 140 companies from OEM sectors, to charging infrastructure, to financial institutions, to logistic companies, to retailers. We accumulate all that data to show where e-mobility fits in in all these different uh, sectors of the economy. And we think that providing this accurate data also shows the proper uh, moment to enter the market. And for a market such as ours, Poland, and I, I smiled when I watched the presentation at the beginning because the Western Northern European countries were very nice and pink, while Poland was more darker uh, in, in, its, in its color and its shade. And, I mean, you know, data shows you where we're at because we have a similar uh, phenomenon of having 62% of our public charging infrastructure in biggest cities, and the rest is nearly left blank, out of the 1,600 public charges we have, which is not too much. We have a market of 20 million vehicles where only 30,000 are electric and 14,000 fully electric. And that shows you that we're in an infancy kind of period of, of uh, e-mobility development, but the perfect moment to enter the market. And so the question rises, uh, you know, because we usually view data as personal data. GDPR has been mentioned data exchange for interoperability or for charging infrastructure, but there is also important data, very valuable data, for business stakeholders to invoke when making their strategies. And this is, this is kind of what we do to develop the market. Yeah, I agree. I mean, <clears throat> again, I think everybody should be interested in accelerating this migration from uh, combustion engine vehicles to electromobility. And uh, we need to actually tackle the uncertainties that go along with that. And you can only tackle uncertainties if you get information. And therefore, it should be imperative that all the uh, stakeholders in this um, ecosystem that you were referring to are actually starting to uh, liberalize this information market, right? And I'm not uh, saying that everything should be for free, but it should be definitely accessible, right? And from what we had seen in the past is that, uh, especially also the, on the OEM side, a lot of companies that have a lot of data that they also, in theory, want to share, but they don't know how to monetize that. that and since um, uh, they haven't found uh, the the right level of, of certainty when it comes to that question, they just don't share, right? They wait for better ideas. And I think um, uh, that, that is something that uh, we should all try to uh, 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 overcome because uh, if data is not being shared, then information is not sufficient for this acceleration that needs to happen. Okay, so in your assessment, it's not being shared sufficiently. Correct. Would everybody agree? Yeah, would agree. And uh, would also extend that I think, um, to come back to your question, um, if, if we look on the data, I think we have three uh, relevant parts of data. One is the energy critical information, one is the business critical information, and third one is the user convenience uh, relevant information. And I think that especially the third part is currently not covered by the uh, legal frameworks we, we do have that, for example, if you're looking on predictive availability of charging infrastructure, which is very important information for the user, um, there is a difference with, you cannot connect it because it's always, uh, you cannot use it in a very anonymized way in order to, to learn the data and, and train it. So um, you need to have this geoinformatic information and uh, this is in conflict with GDPR, so we do think in several ways that we have there are also definitions in order on how to extend uh, the legal frameworks in order to operate it in future. Yeah, well, I, I wouldn't necessarily state that by definition it's in conflict with GDPR, because I think GDPR states, well, you can collect data as long as you adhere to a certain uh, couple of principles, like indeed if the, uh, if the provider of the data is aware and is able to uh, delete, etc., and if it's anonymized, and specifically if it's used for a, a, a certain purpose. Right, so I think, um, and Marcus, I think you made the distinction between data and information. I think there's, there's a key difference yep. there on what you do with data, 
uh, to process it and make uh, value-added services out of that that actually um, yeah, add value for the, for the end user. And as, as Tom Tom, of course, we, we have done that already for 15 years or so with our traffic, right? We collect um, huge amounts of probe data or geolocation data, uh, but we process that, anonymize that, and we s provide that to the user as a, tr as a useful traffic service. So as long as those principles are adhered, I think, and make it clear uh, in an easy, understandable way, and indeed make sure that the, the user can also opt out if necessary, um, then you can build uh, additional value and, and insights and share that with, with everybody, because then, yeah, that, that will make the industry take that step and, and remove the uncertainty. Yeah, in terms of anonymization, just one single point. Uh, we, we launched this EV club in Poland uh, where, where all EV users and enthusiasts can join in and, of course, they express their consent to use their data. And then we use it in a way that is more anonymous to raise awareness in the, you know, on the market because we show that data processed, analyzed in an anonymous way. And, and we try to develop you know, and, and tackle all these different myths and range anxiety, problems with the uh, home or public charging infrastructure. But we get it from the people who are really on the market mm -hmm. and they agree to use it. And then we can, we can share that data via a huge campaign that we can actually uh, distribute to the market. Okay, so it's about uh, turning to people who agree, who can consent to having their data used, but doesn't that automatically um, also influence the type of person that's participating in this kind of survey, right? So it's people who are already tech savvy and maybe trust that when they're told their data will be kept anonymous, that it's actually, it will be uh, kept uh, anonymous. Um, so let me, let me just, t to sum up, we have a few hindrances to data adequately being shared across the EV ecosystem. We have regula the regulatory framework, which is maybe harder or slower to influence or change. And I want to go back to um, the situation with OEMs, the car manufacturers who have data, they could share it, but they don't really want to share it because you say there isn't a monetary incentive for them to do so. Um, does it take a monetary incentive or is there some other way that OEMs could be pushed to share this at least non-personalized data and give access to all users and developers to further spur on the development of the EV market? Is there any other ways to persuade them or push them? <laughs> Well, I, I, I'm, I wouldn't say that that should be uh, imposed on them by law, to be honest. I think uh, um, restrictions and, and, and laws are not really helpful. I think the OEMs uh, by themselves have um, uh, uh, inc incentivation enough to uh, propel this acceleration of, of uh, immobility. Uh, I think um, there needs to be uh, more assertive action uh, and and uh, also courage on the part of the OEMs to um, uh, to just start and, and see where it takes them. Um, I think there is going to be plenty of opportunities to monetize um, uh, mobility in the future for OEMs. They have a very very strong position, but actually they need uh, to be interested uh, uh, in order to in in uh, moving this industry. Uh, more than anybody else. So I think for them to, to acknowledge that uh, certain information should be shared freely, more or less, um, or at least uh, um, uh, at a certain uh, acceptable level of, of monetari uh, monetization, um, is just a question of, of time and, and realization. I think that, that will come. It's, uh, we need to have this discussion with them. Yeah. yeah. For, for us as a market organization for representing, we, we quite easily acquire data from OEMs, actually. But the challenge arises to verify it because it is very often data that is shared in order to build a kind of you know, picture or market representation that isn't always entirely accurate. And uh, that's the question for all data regarding, uh, for us, like analyzing areas, markets, and, and how, how they can be developed is always to kind of weigh it out and show the scenarios of potential directions where it can develop, because according to some data, things may develop very well. According to some data, they may develop a little bit worse. This is especially true for our region, for the CE region, where shared and weighed out data often gives totally different projections and different targets. Yes. But are you, are you talking about uh, historic data or real-time data? 
Uh, mostly, well, we actually every year issue uh, a report based on data from all of our members, be it charging infrastructure or EVs. So it's historic in, in the sense that it's an annual collection of data, mm -hmm. not present day, definitely, yes. Okay. Yeah, yeah, and I s you, you mentioned trust uh, as well, right? Trust for the user, but I think also trust for the OEMs uh, is important. They're, they're, let's say, concerned as we see new new market entrants uh, having alternative motives to collect that data, uh, just to sell ads, for instance, right? Uh, and they're very, on the one hand, they see kind of monetary opportunities or dollar signs in their eyes that because uh, it's a challenging market, and they have huge investments coming up. Maybe this is a revenue opportunity. Um, so they're, you know, they're pushed and pulled a little bit, uh, but as as long as you can very clearly um, explain what's the purpose of of collecting the data and how it benefits them and their drivers, uh, they're willing, but need step by step to uh, to open up and uh, so that you can develop s services like the like the hazard service, right? So that's not just on probe data, but also on emergency brake lights, and so that we can get uh, accident information and other safety critical information back to users and inform and increase road safety. And I think with EV data, with uh, state of charge levels, right, for, for EVs while driving, if you can explain that this, this will lead to better uh, range estimates, uh, right, and that you can lead to better routes that have more efficient charging stations along the way and lead to better uh, driving experience on, on long distances, um, then they, they are willing to, to open up and as long as they see that purpose uh, for them. But yeah, as trust also comes by foot and, and leaves by, uh, by train uh, or I don't know what the, what the equivalent in, uh, <laughs> in English is, but that's mm -hmm. kind of the, yeah, you need to be careful there. Why don't we get a few concrete examples of how data collection and data sharing works? So, uh, Nastya, maybe you can explain to us uh, what data and insights Tier shares about uh, urban citizens' mo like mobility, what their preferences are. So, what, like, tell us an overview of all the different things you're collecting and where does it get shared and how? Yeah, um, sure. So we do gather uh, user research insights in basically quantitative and qualitative way. We recently conducted this survey with 8,000 European citizens from like major European cities to understand their mobility habits. And this is the data which we use on the one hand to improve our services, to improve our product, the vehicles, and uh, uh, for example, our apps. Uh, and this is the data which cities also ask us to share with them. Of course, anonymized, everything aligned with uh, GDPR. But this is also, in the end, um, what helps us. You were talking about trust. Uh, this is what helps us also to have a trust uh, worth relationship with cities, because cities do not have, uh, basically, they cannot reach out to the end users, right? But they do want, especially now with climate goals, to become, uh, to have more sustainable transportation. And uh, this is our way to, um, makes it more livable to, you know, ask end users, not only our users, but as I mentioned before, also urban citizens um, in general, uh, what are their considerations when it comes to mobility? What uh, use cases do they have? Because when you need to go from A to B, of course, uh, you have this very pragmatic goal, but at the same time, you have different motivations or you have different situations. Sometimes you need to stuff carry around. For example, sometimes you go around with kids. Sometimes you want to get there just very fast. And for all that, you have different types of mobility. It's interesting that you mention um, that uh, TIER shares some of this information with the cities. Yeah. Um, and even if it's sort of under the GDPR regulations, that's only applicable to Europe. And, you know, it just makes me think like a place like the United States, things look very, very different. True. And it was just interesting because um, just earlier this year, uh, in the city of Los Angeles, their Department of Transportation actually won a lawsuit um, that was filed against the city by an e-scooter firms, right? And that were resisting sharing real-time data with the city um, Department of Transportation. And the court decided in favor of the city that the e-scooter firms actually must share um, this real-time data, and obviously, you know, they say that they need it for mobility govern governance um, in the municipalities. 
Um, could we see something similar happening uh, in Europe? I think the situation in US and Europe are they're very different, let's say, when it comes to mobility habits and uh, handling the data. Uh, in Europe, at least in case of tier, we prefer to work with cities. For example, we're integrated in 40 mobility as a service applications. So we see ourselves more like a uh, you know, partner for cities. And um, they do reach, to us, uh, reach out to us proactively. They share some requests with us for evaluation of data or to learn about mobility habits, they're actually um, seeing us also more of a partner. Of course, there is always hesitance uh, because it's a very new service. It's just a very new type of mobility, right? Uh, but at the same time, this is a developing relationship. Well, I know that people, at least government officials, were complaining about the data and the number of accidents with e-scooters, especially since they were first rolled out. So, yeah. Uh, when it comes to the accidents, there was a recent safety report which says that 88% uh, of scooter incidents happen usually uh, in collision with the heavier vehicles being cars. This is one thing to consider. Then I think there's also important to remember that how many accidents with cars in general happen, and this is a very low number compared to micromobility. Uh, I mean, it's high, like micromobility has a very low number. Um, and yeah. We are working now also together with different authorities to track the incidents, uh, why are they ha how they are happening, to also, of course, improve the safety of our vehicles. And we just, uh, you know, uh, see our uh, other scooter companies as our allies in this sense. I don't know if you heard about it, but there are like multiple partnerships with other companies where we, for example, try to improve the parking situation or um, less clutter on the sidewalks, for example. So you do share your data with other scooter companies? <laughs> That's not what I said. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> I said that we uh, work with them together. <laughs> we do share the data with cities that we do. I mean, again, of course, anonymized and only the very specific data that is uh, yeah, compliant with uh, GDPR. Okay, so you don't share your data with other e-scooter companies. Is that correct? <laughs> Uh, I wouldn't be so, uh, you know, uh, polarizing this. Uh, all these scooter companies, of course, uh, be it US or uh, Europe, they do care about uh, their competitive advantage. Obviously, there is some kind of data that you would not disclose. Uh, but to improve the general situation on the market, you do need to share at least some kind of like trends, you know, mm -hmm. so. Okay, interesting. Um, what's the picture like at TomTom? Tom? So what, are, what data is being collected? Uh, how is it being collected? And then what do you do with it? Uh, yeah, good question. So TomTom Tom has been a big data company actually for, uh, well, before it became a buzzword. Uh, so we collect data uh, from uh, uh, mapping vehicles that actually drive around with cameras. Uh, to government sources uh, uh, as well for, for uh, road work incidents, for instance, but also indeed 600 uh, million connected devices provide uh, probe data or location uh, data to, uh, to TomTom. Um, and we've done that since, uh, since the start, right? So, uh, and for us, it's also key uh, to, on the one hand, make sure that um, yeah, there's value, valuable information towards our users. Uh, but that we also process that according to the GDPR, uh, and, and um, well, we, we try to be as strict as, as possible on, uh, on that as well. So maybe in the US, laws and, and um, kind of society is a bit uh, less restrictive on that, but we still try to adhere to the, uh, yeah, the highest standard in that sense. Um, so it's, it's used for traffic services, for, for mapping and, and uh, you know, detecting if there's a roundabout uh, being created instead of a, a junction. Um, and increasingly, indeed, for, for uh, providing uh, um, electric vehicle drivers with the best routes uh, via charging stations, or maybe not, because the range is sufficient you know, for, what is it, 95% of your trips. Um, but also, indeed, with municipalities. So, so we do also share, share data in the sense that um, you know, we have traffic analysis for municipalities. We've, we've recently uh, opened also a junction analysis, so you can actually see for municipalities to... Um, uh, uh, how do you say to plan uh, new new road infrastructure uh, projects? Uh, how many percent go turns left or turns right? Uh, but again, that's that's just a percentage number, and it's not indeed uh, which uh, car has driven at that partic particular time um, towards that uh, that destination. So it's we we really need to take care, and we're you know 
we audit ourselves, and, and it's it's a part of the the DNA of TomTom Tom to make sure that um, uh, we don't collect data that's not used <laughs> in the end. I feel like GDPR has become this kind of, I don't know, like monster or like this sort of like elephant or just something that's just so inconvenient and so, you know, everybody rolls their eyes and it's just annoying. Um, but does it serve a good function, do you think? Or is it just something that we have to deal with and we think it's, it's, it's hindering innovation, it's hindering cooperation, and it's just a pain in everybody's you know where? I think um, it obviously serves uh, the function of protecting people's privacy. And that is uh, something that is very valuable. Uh, one has to acknowledge that. On the other hand, then it should be also the individual's choice as to what data they feel uh, they can share. And they need to be educated about that. I think, I mean, if, if you look at Google Maps, for example, I think nobody would argue that that is a service that uh, uh, oversteps certain, I mean, OK, there are obviously always people who say that, that Google is uh, uh, collecting too, too much data and, and also Google Maps. But most of uh, the people I know use Google Maps and use traffic analysis, right? And um, does TomTom Tom also have traffic analysis, real-time? Right, OK. So this is a useful service. And people obviously voluntarily contribute to that by sharing their individual data. Obviously, it's not personal data. It's or personal information. To use your distinction, but it's it's data, and it, it serves a purpose. And I think also, especially when it comes to uh, this movement that has now um, uh, 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 started around uh, e-mobility and sustainability. I mean, elections are coming up in, in Germany. I think uh, the Green Party has uh, experienced a, a huge increase in interest because people realize that. Uh, this is a very important topic. I think if you educate the people about the necessity and the uh, importance of them sharing certain data, they can actually um, uh, uh, forgo their right of, of, of privacy at least to a certain limit, right? And uh, relinquish some of that, um, uh, you know, um, uh, rights uh, because it serves a better purpose. So that might be another uh, option. Obviously, we can talk about um, adapting a GDPR, but uh, in parallel, we should also try to educate people as to how to uh, voluntarily uh, relinquish data. I think there's also, though, um, a lack of trust, maybe. Well, first of all, I ask myself, it's very nice that, that companies say they're adhering to GDPR, but like, who's enforcing this? Like, how do I know that my data isn't being sold or, you know, why am I suddenly getting all of these spam phone calls, uh, advertising or, you know, emails that I didn't sign up for? Something went wrong, right? So, I mean, is it even possible to enforce this kind of data security or privacy that, you know, the EU is trying maybe to establish something like this, but is it even realistic? Well, I think the fines make it realistic, and that's what is really, I think, the tool to enforce it efficiently, uh, maybe half-jokingly. But I, I agree fully with what was said, I think, before, is, is really building the awareness is the priority here. I mean, uh, that's, that's exactly why I mentioned this, the, the campaign we're doing, and, and not to go back to it, but providing data when you're aware it serves a purpose to develop you know, better mobility and better solutions is, is, is very good. And actually, we, we also ran a micro-mobility group before COVID in Poland. This was a huge topic. There were a number of operators as well. And there were, yes, there were a lot of complaints about accidents, that's, that's actually true. And a lot of them were uh, against pedestrians, but that is mostly because the issue was completely unregulated in Poland. And uh, what I think was the most important factor in regulating the matter, and, and we also participated in this, as the, in this process, was sharing data with municipalities and with the regulators to show what the tendencies are, what the problem areas are, and this way the problems were solved. So data sharing became the main solution, and actually the operators shared it very willingly. So again, I think, I think you know, and, and they were made aware that they could either be banned or share their data, shape good regulation, and operate very well. This was the case in Poland. So yeah, that's, I think that ties in with what was said. Yeah. I'd like to shift back a little bit towards uh, 
EV charging related data, and I know that your association also collects mm. a lot of data on EV charging. What is your goal with collecting this data, and what do you do with it? So it's it's exactly the same reason. It's it's market development. I mean, what we do well, we don't collect charging uh, data. I mean, ch charging infrastructure data directly. Our members do that. Our member companies do that, of course. What we do is we collect that data to show a clear picture of the market, and that's very important because. Uh, for us at this moment, I think you know it's being copiously discussed the Fit for 55 package, Afid becoming Afir, all the targets, all the regulations therein. But what's really important is to shape these targets realistically for our areas because they are so different, and the the plan, the strategy for developing this infrastructure is so entirely different than what's true for uh, you know Western Northern economies, and this is both for chargers as well as for EVs. In both areas, those targets are, are entirely different. And the target to, to ban ICE registrations in 235, I mean, that for Poland is, is a huge challenge for the entire region. It's very similar with the charging infrastructure. So what we do is we get that data. Also, the problem areas, again, are very important. For example, charging companies tell us how long it takes to install a public charging uh, station in Poland, which at the shortest is half a year. And that is because the administrative and formal uh, regulations that have not yet caught up to the technological advance. And of course, as a market, we're working to get there. But that's, you get that because you, you, get, you collect all the data, you aggregate all the information uh, from the operators, and you actually see uh, the tendency. Uh, the same thing is with implementing the actual infrastructure along the network of roads. You see the tendencies of what, uh, that's again what we do with the users as well, because one side is the, the, te the technological, the business side, the operators, but the other side is the users. The stakeholders who actually use those charges and use that infrastructure. If you combine that data, you really see where it should develop, what routes it should take. Yeah. Well, one mobility trend of the future that is going to rely on enormous amounts of data, obviously, is autonomous driving, autonomous vehicles. I mean, that just, it's, it's madness. It's everything. It's traffic data. It's user data. It's charging data. It's... Um, your entertainment data. Um, and, you know, sometimes, like, if, if I talk to my husband about, the, you know, the idea of an autonomous car, he's like, no way, no way. I would never, you know, set foot into something like that. Like, there's all these cameras, there's all these sensors. It's going to be just be basically collecting information on everybody's habits and activities, and who knows where that data is going to go. I think there's just still... For a lot of people, a lot of uh, anxiety and fear about surveillance. I mean, at the end of the day, that's also part of it, right? I mean, traffic data, your driving habits, all of that, you're, being, you're under surveillance. So how do you reassure people that they're not going to be recorded doing something that they don't want anybody to see them doing? Um, just to use advanced mobility services? So first of all, I think it's a question of, again, how long the data is being stored um, in order to also uh, ensure that it's not being misused, right? So if it's being stored for a brief moment in a format that uh, allows for personal identification um, and otherwise it's being abstracted and anonymized, I think, um, uh, that is okay, and then you need actually the uh, uh, executive forces to uh, test whether that kind of data storage behavior is being um, uh, implemented or not by the respective companies, right? Um, so you need to actually um, uh, uh, follow through. You need to see uh, whether companies are complying. And that's the case already today, right? We are already living in an inf uh, information age. Uh, where that needs to be enforced already today. Um, ultimately, I think this is progress that can't be uh, held up anyway. So this is going to happen anyway. It's a question of time. It's not a question of whether it happens or not. And therefore, I think people will get around to it. They will get used to it, to live with this uh, higher degree of transparency, of exposure, as they have gotten used to, I mean, if you would have told people 20, 25 years ago 
what data is already available today about them in theory, right? They would have said, no way, ever. We would never tolerate something like that. That will never happen, and it has happened, right? Yeah. So uh, it's a question of, of following through, of, of, of ensuring uh, from a regulatory perspective, but otherwise it's a question of education and people getting used to it. You know, I mean, the whole question of new mobility is related to, to data sharing. I mean, what was mentioned, mobility as a service. Uh, you know, we were involved in shaping one of those applications in Poland with, with a huge investor because it's an ING. And, and all the micromobility, shared mobility, public transportation, all these operators and the users have to share and interchange data to make this application work. And this is, I mean, getting vehicles out of city centers, especially ICE vehicles, uh, this is the main solution, right? To really allow easy transportation, skipping from one means to another, all zero emission. Uh, and so mobility as a service is, I think, one step towards that, uh, towards that uh, destination. But autonomous technologies, of course, is, is a huge challenge for, I think, most European countries still, still quite a vision of the future. But the more mobility services rely on data, aren't we also making, a, making a, ourselves more and more vulnerable to data breaches, cyber attacks, you know, that kind of crime? So how aware are EV companies or players in the EV ecosystem about the risks? The more data reliant we become, the more vulnerable we can be to cyber crime. Do you feel that enough is being done to also protect you know, mobility companies from, from that danger? And I think that's not an, an, a phenomenon which is only limited to mobility. So uh, we do see in every sector that a huge amount of data is being collected. And I would, would argue that in around about 90% of the cybersecurity incidents, uh, the lack or the, the issue was the human being, which is using the systems in the wrong way or distributing the data in the wrong way. And if you, if you think we, we, do, we do everything in order to protect the information of the data, but we cannot protect that any user of the company who has access to his specific information shares it with any other, have stored his password in an uh, open, open setup or anything else, does not use uh, multi-factor authentication, or everything is, is being there. So I think we, we should need to focus especially on the education um, what data we have, and especially also what is the risk in sharing the data. Because if we look on the companies and you say, uh, this is a critical information, I would say 80% do not understand why, for example, this energy or geographic information is critical. And I think that's a very important step for uh, our current situation in order to bring this information to the uh, users itself. Yeah. Yeah, I, I would agree. I mean, um, uh, yes, companies become more and more vulnerable, um, uh, and systems become more vulnerable. I mean, uh, if you look at uh, legislation in the US, uh, when companies try to offer services in uh, the energy space that is related or are related to the grid security, for example, they have to abide by very, very strict regulation uh, when it comes to data security, et cetera, et cetera. So I think that they are aware of that risk and they are being made aware of, of uh, that risk by regulations, right? That's why I'm also not saying GDPR is completely wrong, right? It's just a question of um, uh, where are the boundaries and uh, about educating people about uh, applying it in the right way. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, maybe to bring it back to the metaphor of this discussion, right? So data can be a bit like a liquid to, that, that can flow everywhere if you don't control it, right? But you want to channel it to the right purposes. And I think regulation uh, makes sure that mm. that channels uh, that data correctly. And, um, you know, also a bit the, uh, the analogy that we, we want to avoid the reputation of what oil can do uh, in the world um, uh, uh, as well and to, uh, to our ecosystem. Uh, but at the same time, it's a lubricant uh, as information indeed to uh, to make yeah certain business processes flow more uh, um, 
yeah, correctly and, and educate people so that we do have access to the right services. So on the one hand, let's try to avoid data being the new oil, uh, but on the other hand, let's use information as a lubricant uh, uh, as well to, uh, to increase e-mobility. And if we look ahead to the future, because that is the central focus of this year's conference, looking to 2025, can we reassure consumers? Can we look forward to some new services, new um, benefits of data uh, to their user experience in e-mobility? Anyone, sure. Yeah. I think we will have the very, very high development. So we, we made a study with the uh, University of Graz in, uh, for example, predicting the availability of charging infrastructure. And the, the bad information was that we do currently have not enough data in order to uh, make a, a realistic prediction. Um, but the good information was that um, we need round about the double data we have today in order to make it realistic. And if you look back to the market development, our data is currently doubling round about uh, every half year. So uh, this is a consequence that we do think that within the next 12 months, the IT systems will be um, comprehensive enough in order to predict availability of infrastructure, predict the occurrence of failures. So I would say that we will be able in the next 12 months that the user can be sure that if this charging station is being displayed available in his entertainment system, it's a 99.9% .9 availability. And that's the interesting thing. I think the convenience will be much greater in the future. And uh, that's the most important thing in order to roll out e-mobility in a global way. Yeah. So I think convenience is the 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 key word here, right? Yeah. So I think in 2025, our life is going to be looking very different from today because it's in so many aspects so much more convenient. And to be honest, how often do people already think about how great it would be to now take an autonomously driving car home or something, right? Uh, definitely, I thought that yesterday after our kicker tournament. Um, uh, so I think it's going to be overwhelmingly more uh, attractive to use the technology because of those convenience aspects than not to use the technology of because of uh, um, reservations and, and, and uh, fear of, of data breaches. But also, I'm, I'm, I'm an optimistic person. <laughs> no, but I think you could easily join the optimism. There are so many uh, awareness-building campaigns, and, and really people are gaining trust, I think, and they're seeing that these solutions work really well. I mean, for our market, which is an emerging, again, market, uh, there's so, so much enthusiasm for new technologies, both yeah. in terms of uh, EV, electromobility, but in terms of trusting other, you know, mobility as a service technologies, and so many discussions are arising uh, regarding autonomous technologies as well. Uh, so I, I think I think <laughs> I could quote a, a problem that I, I had when I was spoken I was speaking to Mobileye, uh, one of the autonomous mm -hmm. vehicles leaders, and they said that in Israel actually most people were trying to crash into the car to prove that it wasn't <laughs> good enough. That was their biggest problem. But everybody's really wanting it yeah. to come along as fast as they can. So <laughs> yeah, now, I don't know whether you saw that there was a video going through the internet not long ago about this autonomously driving car that has. Uh, passed through a small village in uh, China with uh, all the foot traffic, bikes, dogs, um, cars, obviously, super narrow streets. Um, it was just amazing to see how, uh, uh, how much progress has been made in that field already. Yeah. Absolutely amazing. Yeah. All right, we have just a few minutes uh, left, and we do want to give our audience a chance to ask their questions. Of course, also we're inviting our um, online audience to send in their questions uh, as well. As always, just use the Mentimeter tool. Um, if you haven't already, there was a QR code. There is a QR code. Um, there it is. Or you can type in those numbers, and we invite you to share maybe even some comments if you like, or a question for any of our panelists. Um, I see there is already one coming through. Uh, someone is asking, what kind of new data-driven services will emerge in the near future? 
So we just touched upon that a bit, but does anybody want to add something else? Well, maybe one one thing I've uh, <laughs> you know we've seen uh, today and yesterday as well is uh, the the challenge also for grid management, uh, right? And for uh, in the in the pricing of uh, of charging sessions and making sure uh, that that there's there's transparency there. And I think uh, with data um, becoming more and more shared and and, and open, uh, I think we can uh, also incentivize EV drivers. Uh, to get to the right charging station and use the right uh, charging card um, to, for instance, avoid peak uh, peak charging and and that that way uh, kind of distribute the the energy demand and um, um, yeah basically improve the the grid uh, grid operation that way. Uh, so I think there's there's going to be increased uh, interest. Uh, I think not only from the grid but also for the user if we can incentivize that uh, the user to use the right um, yeah, to charge at the right time. I think that's that's one of the uh, the direction that will uh, will increase. There's another question uh, coming through. Someone asks, "Do the panelists feel that information currently shared with market participants is sufficient to accurately plan e-mobility rollout?" No. <laughs> <laughs> I think we all agree yeah. that not yet. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's sufficient yeah. and accuracy, right? That, that's, the, that's the two keywords. <clears throat> I think, yes, of course, we can plan the immobility rollout. But if we had more information, it could, would be faster. Yeah, we would accelerate things. Yeah. And more accurate if you more, more share, leave, uh, share, for example, availability information. So all the data I showed was only limited to our infrastructure. And for example, also in, in using uh, planning tools where to install new charging infrastructure is uh, extremely div driven by the availability and the usage of this infrastructure in the global view of, of, of Germany. And uh, if, you, if you think on the rollout, uh, sometimes it makes more sense to extend existing charging spots and create new ones uh, some kilometers uh, uh, away. So um, I think the, the very important thing and, and what, what, what I would suggest is to also create a collected database on availability and usage information in an abstract way in, in a German-wide system, for example, a European-wide system in, in future in order to make the planning more efficient. Mm -hmm. So I'm just wondering, because you clearly said you are not in favor of even more regulations or legal frameworks to force companies to share data. Um, it was mentioned that there should be some monetary incentive, but if there isn't that, uh, I'd like to ask again, so what can be done to in increase the sharing of data so that we are able to be better about the EV rollout in the coming years? I mean, take the EV100 Association, for example. That is a voluntary <coughs> assembly, so to speak, of, of companies that have pledged to accelerate uh, the uh, path towards sustainability and mobility. Um, I think similar to that, there could be a data alliance uh, for the sake of uh, this acceleration as well. So companies that own, possess, <coughs> generate data could say, OK, so there's certain elementary data that we will share. And we don't have to, but we will, because we, we believe in, in sharing data, we believe in collaboration. And other companies might join that, that movement, right? I think it, it takes courageous, uh, assertive leaders in the industry to actually join forces. We have uh, time maybe for one or two last questions. Uh, the next one is, how do you see the link between the software as a service platform and EV? What role will this play in the further development of the market? From our perspective, we, uh, perspective, we do see that the software as a service platform itself will collect real-time information, aggregate this information, and spread it to the relevant consumers. Uh, which to consume this information in order to optimize their services. Were there, yeah. did anybody want to add something to that? Because otherwise we'll see if we can get one more question in. Yep. And maybe this is the last one. When will we have privacy 
aware EV roaming protocols or a privacy aware ESO IEC. I never know how to read eight. this number. 15, 118. <laughs> so anybody want to tackle that one? Summarize maybe hope in the next uh, two to three years. I think we have, especially in the roaming, we have some technologies in order to make it uh, more uh, secure than it is today if we use it in the right way. And I think we have also the same possibilities with the UC, uh, I, uh, ISO uh, EC uh, 15118. So I think it's a development in, in the market. I think we are in the beginning, especially for plug and charge. It's, we are currently performing the first tests. And uh, I think the involvement or and the extension will be very fast if it's becoming a mass market in, in the next month. Yeah, thank you for a really great discussion. Uh, Nastya Koro, Martin Gleisner, Markus Kruger, Alexander Reich, and Robin van der Berg. It was a pleasure uh, to discuss with all of you, and thank you to our audience for your questions. Thank you. Thank you so thank much. You.